Hello and welcome to the REIC Corporate Affiliate Series. Our corporate affiliate for today's webinar is CR Lawrence. CRL is the industry's leading full service provider of architectural metals, glass fittings, and professional grade glazing supplies. The company leverages more than 50 years of experience and a track record of industry firsts to offer a one-stop shop with a breadth of innovative product choices. Expert support from specification to installation and fast, reliable service helps customers to complete projects on time and on budget. CRL focuses on expanding opportunities for all to turn bold architectural visions into real-world experiences. Today's presentation is titled Glass Entrance Specification, What You Need to Know, presented by Mark Suhiro. Good day, my name is Mark Suhiro. I am the Technical Director for the Commercial Hardware Department here at CR Lawrence. Um, we are looking at some glass entrances and some specifications, a few things you may need to know to help um, kind of get things rolling and understand more of a, a heavy glass aspect of it. Uh, again, my name is Mark Subiro. Um, more than 15 years of experience in the industry, uh, about 28 overall, but within the door hardware section, you're looking at about 15. Um, my specialization goes into the specs, goes into how that door hardware is gonna work. I work very closely with the engineering department to um, make sure that we've got some longevity products out there. You know, the, the best door is the one that you never see again. Uh, learning objectives. We're going to identify some considerations in regards to UL requirements, uh, ANSI and BHMA criteria, um, an overall overview of uh, all the, the hardware options and kind of compatibilities, thinking how things work together. Um, understanding the relationships between some of the aesthetics versus the performance, um, defining a few of the GANA guidelines, um, keeping things within those limitations, um, and taking a look at some of the current trends and, and where things are headed in, in the future. We're really going to look at, into some of the security, safety, and accessibility that, that really leads into those uh, GANA guidelines as well as the ANSI and BHMA. Um, we're hoping to get you a little bit better insight as to how these heavy glass entrances can work and how some of the designs can really lead into the aesthetics of the building. So identifying some of the basics. One of the first things that I like to talk to architects about, it, it seems really simple, but it's really look up, look down, look left, look right in the instance of how things are all going to be working together. Uh, the picture on the screen right now, for example, um, you're going to see a couple pairs of doors that are side by side, but you're going to see that the pair of doors doesn't have anything. Typically, there's a fixed light in between one pair to the next. So aesthetically, it looks great. But functionality speaking, those two doors, one is hinging on the right, and one hinging on the left, if those doors are open at the same time, you're going to run into some issues with, with compatibility of those two openings. So it's, it's something to really think about when we're designing the openings. Okay, as I'm sure everybody thinks about, less is more. You know, the more glass you have, the less you can really see, um, the less sight lines, everybody wants that see through. Um, so really looking at those heavy glass doors as aesthetic as well as functional um, is making a, a big difference. Um, looking at like the Bloomcraft devices is a good example of those uh, aesthetics along with the functionality. So that's what we're showing here is how we can get those minimal sight lines, um, but keep it to the codes and the functionality of how we want to separate two areas. Okay, with heavy glass doors, you've got really three common setups. Um, on our side, you're going to hear it quite often. There's a P style, a BP style, and an A style. So what they're really referring to there is just how that glass is going to be mounted to the surrounding portions of the door. So your P style is going to have a full top rail and a full bottom rail. Your BP is going to have a full bottom rail and just a patch fitting at the top. And your A style is going to have patch fittings both top and bottom. When you're looking at the bottom three there, your F, your A1, and A2, it's really just those P, B, P, and A's with the addition of something else, typically locking hardware. So looking at that F type, it's just the addition of another patch fitting so that you can put a bottom rail lock versus an A1, that's a P style along with uh, what's referred to as a patch lock. And then on occasion, I've seen the A2, 
um, where they just kind of want that balance for some reason. You still got that hatch lock in the um, typical height of about 42 inches above finished floor. And then for whatever reason, they wanted that auxiliary at the bottom. So looking at the functionality of it, you're really just going to see those, those top three most common. Uh, point supported is another good example of ways to get around some of the aesthetics. Um, this particular opening is using a 10 inch bottom rail at the bottom, a patch fitting at the top that is tied into the point support for the fin as well as your transom and fixed glass next to it. So it really gives that all glass look along with meeting that, that 10 inch bottom rail code that I'm sure everybody's heard of. Um, looking at this opening, you'll notice that the fixed lights next to the doors themselves are just glazed into a small little u-channel again giving it that that all glass look giving it as much see-through or visionary as possible okay some of the points supported um, this one was um, one of the main facilities for the uh, gatorade um, again they wanted this heavy glass wall that really gave them that see-through. You'll see the second floor and the first floor really looks like you've just got one giant piece of glass giving you the see-through. Um, you've got a four-point support at some areas that it ties into that uh, area separating your first floor from second floor, as well as tying in the fins for any kind of wind load deflection. And this is one we did from Louisiana Sports Hall, Hall of Fame. Um, the opening itself actually is uh, rectangular. Now what the architect did on this was kind of built the wall around the heavy glass itself. That way they could get this almost cave type of look going into the area along with giving it that, that solid support and surrounding. So for the wind load they added the fins at the interior to make sure they could go up as high as they wanted to and having a floating header above the door gave it a nice stable point there. Um, installing these into a storefront aluminum system actually is pretty common. We see it here in Southern California quite often where um, they've got a simple two by four and a half glazing system going all the way around, maybe a curtain wall, but they want the heavy glass doors inside. So in this particular opening, it was just a two by four and a half offset system using one inch glazing. They used some patch fittings at the top for the doors and the 10 inch bottom rail at the bottom. Some simple tall ladder poles along with bottom rail locks gives the openings themselves or the doors uh, a very clean aesthetic look along with the performance of the storefront surrounding the entire area. Um, this was a mall, just an interior mall front. Then again, they wanted to kind of incorporate that uh, really glossy black storefront surrounding, but again, giving them the heavy glass door leaves themselves. So they've got the 10 inch bottom rail, um, four inch at top rail, as opposed to the patch fittings in the last slide. And they're just using a half inch thick monolithic glass. Okay, again, similar to the last one, we're just looking at the patch fittings at the top. They went with a polished stainless steel, giving it that reflection. Um, but as far as the installation is concerned, it's extremely similar. You've just got an overhead concealed closer with the header across the top. 10 inch bottom rails and a patch fitting, bottom rail locks in the bottom for security. Uh, but being kind of a wall front, these doors are going to be left open during business hours. Um, a lot of these in the mall front settings, they'll actually lock the doors into the open position um, so that they can't be closed during business hours. Okay, one of the questions I see quite often is, can we use this in a storefront application, but I want the doors to be completely flush to the outside, like an offset pivoted storefront door would be? Uh, the answer is yes, it's, it's relatively common. Um, what I've done is just made a, a quick little elevation or a, a illustration of a bottom floor closer. It's mimicking a, a Rickson application. <clears throat> so you're looking at a three quarter inch offset to the center line of the pivot point. And that allows the door to free swing out of the opening, but it also keeps that door flush to the exterior. Um, I see it most commonly with the storefront uh, surrounding conditions where they want to keep that aesthetics to the exterior. Um, in that case, you can either use a four inch bottom rail or a 10 inch bottom rail. 
um, occasionally with a patch fitting at top, but most commonly it's going to be a full top rail as well. Okay, some of the other applications for heavy glass is um, trophy cases and, and that type of application that we see in, uh, in a lot of colleges and high schools, uh, museums, that kind of application. Um, we have our Bloomcraft 1301 is pretty popular uh, where you've got some really low profile top and bottom rails um, that keep as much heavy glass as possible. Um, some of the panels are fixed, some of them can be swinging so that they can change out any kind of display that's going on inside of those cases. And one of the common applications, of course, is your panic handles. The panic handles themselves are what we refer to as ACH or access control handles can be a couple of different ways. Um, they can be used mechanically, like most panic devices on hollow metal, aluminum, or even wood doors. Um, but in this case, the exterior handle is integrated along with the interior. Now, it doesn't have to be. Um, I get the request quite often where they've got some kind of, of special pull handle that they want. Um, one example was a Mercedes-Benz dealership where they had a pair of doors. When the doors were closed, it created the Mercedes-Benz emblem. When the doors were being opened, it basically cut in half, but they needed the panic function um, for that fire code requirement so they could have the panic devices at the interior and use their own exterior pull handles. The only thing to keep in mind is with the exterior cylinder, you want to make sure that you've got the right height and distance of where those handles should be located, that it doesn't conflict with the exterior cylinder. So here we're showing just a couple of handles that we do have available for the exterior. Um, I would say the D type and the F type are probably the most popular just because of aesthetics. Um, your D type is going to basically mimic the interior handle to the exterior. And your F type handle is going to be your full height exterior ladder pole. I get the question quite often on that full height ladder pole. Does it have to be 10 inches up off the finished floor? Um, by code, the answer is no. Our uh, inspectors will argue that fact quite often, but the code reads that you must clear 10 inches uninterrupted surface on the push side of the door. Not all inspectors are going to allow that, even though it is in the code. So we do have an FS, where we refer to that as just your full height exterior, Shorten. So we'll leave it 10 inches up. That way you just don't have a problem with the inspector later on down the line. Okay, the operation of the panics is completely mechanical at the top. Um, there's a knuckle at the top that allows that bar to retract or be pushed towards the physical glass itself. That pulls the lever down at the head and allows for mechanical exit at all times. And there's two different pivot locations to allow that to happen. One at the top, of course, and then one at the hinge side referred to on the screen and circled in red as the letter B. Um, this is what allows that bar to bend. It's not actually the, the metal bending. Those are knuckles that are allowing that to, to retract. Okay. Um, cylinders at the exterior, we do provide as a standard the small format interchangeable core. Um, but it's very common where buildings have a specific heat coating system. Maybe it's a Sargent or a Schlage Primus or a Best or something to that effect. If it's not one that you're using that is available with a small format IC core, um, the cylinders can easily be changed out. Standard one is an inch and an eighth. However, it can accommodate as much as an inch and a quarter for a 710. Um, they just need to be switched out. It's relatively easy to do. Kind of showing that operation at the top, as I mentioned, when that uh, device is uh, depressed, your roller latch at the top is going to retract. So in the upper left-hand corner, you can see where that roller is what allows that to come closed, hit the strike, uh, the ramp, if you will, which retracts that roller and then projects back out into the keeper. Okay, this could be mounted on um, like we saw earlier with the A-type where you just have a patch fitting. So at the locking side, you're just going to have glass. That's your upper left-hand picture. There in the center at the top is mounting to a full top rail, like a P-1000 
style rail. Um, the keyed access is a little unique in the fact that it comes, uh, let's say, horizontally. Your keyed access is going from the side as opposed to directly into like most doors. Um, what this has allowed us to do is to keep it really narrow profile and keep it hidden within that one and a quarter inch diameter tubing that, that creates the device itself. Okay. These can be used with electric strikes. If you have the requirement for um, any type of card reader, motion sensor, biometrics, whatever the case may be, um, the electric strike is basically just going to release once that is uh, activated, um, allowing exterior usage. Uh, once the door comes closed, it rides on the ramp, retracts the latch, and goes right back to the keeper for a secure opening. Um, we do get the request uh, on occasion for no exterior cylinder, um, whereas most people would know that as an exit only, um, in which case we would just use the retainer plate, which allows that to hold nice and steady. And now you have no key cylinder access from the exterior. A couple of standards and codes. Um, we work with the IBC and NFPA 101 for the life safety codes. Uh, panic devices to be listed in accordance with UL 305, standard for panic hardware. Uh, BHMA, known as Builders Hardware Manufacturers Association, um, also has its own standards for panic hardware. It's the A156.3 exit devices, um, all of which the devices need to be certified with and um, all of ours, we will work with them very closely to make sure that we've got everything dialed in per the new codes. And one thing to think about when looking at like exit devices or can I use bottom rail lock? When do I have to use that type of locking device? You're really looking at the occupancy. So most conference rooms are between 10 and 12 people. You don't need an exit device for that type of opening. Uh, but you do have to be very careful that people cannot get locked into that type of opening. So really looking and working with your local fire codes is extremely important to make sure that you're not putting something in that opening that is going to cause some kind of harm down the line. So really take a look at uh, where am I going to? Where am I coming from? Is this a conference room? Is it an office? Um, am I just kind of coordinating off a hallway? Um, those kinds of things can really help identify what type of hardware needs to be used. And then the aesthetics going around that is what I will typically recommend to most architects. Uh, IBC is your International Building Code, 1010.1.10.1. Um, it's a very lengthy way to say the actuating portion of the releasing device shall extend not less than one half of the door leaf width. Uh, part of the reason that's so important is, again, it is a panic device. Panic came in because if you are in a panic, you cannot go looking for a key, um, some required pinching thumb turn. It is made so that you can be in a panic and run at that door and get out. So swing doors require that horizontal as your uh, portion going across the door. It must be greater than one half of the net door leaf to meet the IBC codes. Now, uh, 1.9.2 requires the height of those devices. So door handles, poles, latches, locks, and other operating devices shall be installed between 34 and 48 inches. When you get into California, it's a little bit more stringent. I believe it's 38 to 48. Um, they get a little tighter on those as you start heading out too far west. Uh, your typical bar is mounted at 42 inches above the finished floor, uh, being your actuating portion. Now you'll notice in this, the key cylinder for the typical devices um, is 10 and a half inches above that horizontal bar. That is not an actuating portion or an operating portion, if you will. Um, that's where that can kind of fit into the code. Okay, balance doors. I'm not sure too many people come across this as you uh, go across the states, but especially out on the East Coast, you see a lot of balance doors. 
Um, those have a little bit different swing. Uh, it's actually a rolling pivot as opposed to a hard pivot point. Your center hung doors have a two and three quarter inch uh, typical back set from inside the jam to the center line of the pivot point. And that portion makes part of the door swing in, part of the door, most of the door swing out. An offset pivot will cause the entire door to swing outward. A balanced door, on the other hand, has a rolling pivot. So you end up with about 40% of the door swinging inward, 60% of the door swinging outward. What that also does is it causes the need to push the door closer to the locking side. Okay, in doing so, pushing too close to the hinge side, the door doesn't move. So the International Building Code uh, 1010.1.10.2 1 really gets into that and says that in this case, panic devices must be less than 50% of the door leak. This is gonna cause people to really push this on the correct side of the door, giving it its, its proper functionality. So anytime you're coming across balanced doors, you gotta be really careful of what hardware you're using there to make sure that the doors swing properly. Um, looking at the codes again, um, IBC code, the maximum unlatching force shall not exceed 15 pounds of pressure. Um, that is when you're looking at exit devices, any kind of panic, um, whether they call it a panic and exit device, whatever terminology they want to use, you cannot cause more than 15 pounds of pressure to get the door in motion. Now, that being said, when you get to the CBC, which is the California Building Code, operable parts shall be operable with one hand and shall not require tight grasping, pinching, or twisting of the wrist. <clears throat> That's when you really start looking at thumb turns and things like that that can be an issue for that. Um, the force required to activate operable parts shall be five pounds maximum. That's really difficult to hit. Five pounds of pressure is an extremely light force, uh, but they're really trying to make it easier for people in wheelchairs, crutches, have those kind of uh, handicaps and still be able to operate the doors. So we have a couple of things that can help with that, whether it's the closers, um, the functionality of the devices, making sure that they're properly installed, um, any type of clearances are done properly, not to cause any dragging and, and keep that five pounds as best as possible. Um, one of the questions I get too often when you're using an exit device, well, what if I want to just lock it down at the end of the day and put a bottom rail lock in there? The answer is no, that is against code. You cannot have any other auxiliary locking other than the panic device. It must be a one function operation. So to walk up and hit the bar is your one function, that's it. If you were to lock it down at the bottom and God forbid there was a fire, somebody's gonna try to panic out of that door and that bottom rail lock is gonna keep them in there. We're gonna have some serious safety issues. Um, one note I like to put on here, key to access does not equal locked. Just because there's a key on the outside doesn't mean that it's locked. So be real careful on that aspect as well. Again, I get that too, calm, too often from, uh, from architects. Okay, um, panic devices, and specifically the UL305 4.3, um, the ends of the crossbar or push pad shall be curved guarded or otherwise designed to prevent catching of the clothing of persons during exit. Um, actually had the occasion and I had to laugh at myself as I was going out of the door. Um, they had a horizontal push bar on there with standoffs. So the standoff was leaving about a two inch gap or lip off the edge of that. As I was walking through the backpack, my backpack got caught on that piece and pulled me down to the floor. Now, everybody thought it was funny for me, but it wouldn't be so funny for somebody who actually got hurt. So having that rounded at the end allows backpacks, purses, anything like that, when you're walking through to not get caught. If it rubs up against it, it simply slides right off, no harm, no foul. 
any type of projection at that end is going to cause them to get caught um, and unfortunately get hurt. So UL's thought about that and actually written that into the code itself. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, panic handles on uh, patch fitting type of doors, like your BP door. Uh, this particular one has a four inch tapered bottom rail, uh, patch fittings at the top, and the panic device is just mounting to the glass at the top. Um, obviously, the glass at the hinge sides and then ties into the bottom rail at the bottom. Um, it can also be done where you just have a patch fitting at the bottom as well, of which we would just have a simple glass attachment at the bottom. So really getting that all glass look, as we mentioned earlier. Okay, single door with top part, top patch hardware and four inch tapered bottom rail. Um, again, that, that piece of the code that, you know, 10 inch bottom rail rule, as long as it's tapered, um, then you'll still meet that, that exception to the rule. I think I've got a slide here that mentions that as well. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to show this picture was specifically because of that, that full height exterior pole, but you'll notice we're 10 inches up. The code again reads that it is only required on the push side of the door. Um, this particular architect slash customer um, didn't even want to battle with it, wanted to leave it short. That way they just don't have the issue out of the job site. Um, inspectors, they will win. <laughs> they're at least going to slow you down enough to be a problem. So we, we've kind of accommodated that and came up with that, that compromise, if you will. Okay, floating headers are a nice way to get a, a over height or over tall glass opening and still have the doors within GANA guidelines, which we'll review here in a minute. Um, that floating header can accommodate an overhead concealed closer. Um, if floor closers are not an option, this is a good way to do it. Um, it still is giving you the support for the transom at the head. Um, it's mechanically fastened onto the fixed glass next to it. Um, two holes on each side allows plenty of strength, whether this is a single door or a pair of doors. Um, you do want to be careful with the overall height of that transom above uh, when you're looking at pairs of doors. The wider the stretch between your support, along with the heavier glass, can cause the headers to sag. Um, so we'll get that request once in a while where we got to hit the brakes and find another way to do it. Um, there are other headers available, like our Bloomcraft uh, 1250 style, uh, where it's actually tied in through some thin cables that run through your silicone glass joint. It can give a little bit more strength. Um, what I typically see people doing is using a smoke baffle at the top. When that transom light starts to get too big or too heavy, that keeps anything out of the sight lines. It actually ties the transom to the um, smoke baffle header at the top and alleviating all of that weight sitting down on that floating header. So a couple of options. Okay, locking ladder poles are getting more and more common um, in those instances where a uh, pending device is not required. Um, bottom rail locks, as you can imagine, can be uh, a little bit of a chore. Uh, anybody trying to use those on a daily basis, it's not so easy to reach down to the floor and, and unlock that lock every single day. <clears throat> Excuse me. So locking ladder poles are a good way to do it. That gets your cylinder on the exterior or ADA approved thumb turn at the interior um, and allows very easy access. But the same idea and functionality works with this as the bottom rail lock. It's really simple, bolt just goes down. Um, in some cases where you do have to meet that 10 inch bottom rail rule, because of course it's interior and exterior, um, you do have the option of it locking upward. Um, difficult part about that is when you start looking at custom heights, that location of the cylinder and thumb turn can change. Um, looking at custom locking ladder poles that lock upward, um, they can be done. They just take a little more lead time. As, as you can imagine, being made to order, as you will, um, can stretch things out as opposed to just being a stock piece of hardware. As I mentioned, the ADA compliant locking ladder poles, um, we've mentioned a couple times here in regards to um, no tight pinching or grasping. 
Um, think of this as just a really small lever handle more than anything. So somebody who might have a, a handicap in their hands where they can't uh, pinch or grasp or anything like that, as they mentioned in the codes, this can simply be thrown one way or the other. Now, obviously it's gonna be in a different location, whether it's up or down, uh, but it's the overall length that the ADA code really looks for. So we've tried to find that happy medium um, as far as that length is concerned. We don't want it to be big and bulky at the same time. We wanna make sure that it's accessible for everybody. Uh, one of the questions I get quite often, and this is the perfect picture to mention it, can we have a cylinder on the interior as opposed to a thumb turn? Unfortunately, the answer is no. All of the working mechanisms for that bolt are at the interior. This keeps that safety issue away from people being able to tamper with it from the outside. That being said, within that one and a quarter inch diameter material, there's just no space for a cylinder to be able to sit inside of there. So thumb turn on the interior, cylinder on the exterior is the standard application. Got the locking ladder pulls as well as the panics, as I mentioned earlier. Um, they are equipped with a small format interchangeable core. We went with the small format because it's the most common throughout manufacturers. Whether you go to Schlage, uh, Best, Falcon, Sargent, Corbin Ruswin, all of the major cylinder manufacturers, even Medeco, um, has a small format available. Now, if you were to choose a large format, let's say from Sargent, that does not fit into a large format from Schley, let's say. So large format cylinders are unique to the manufacturer, whereas the small formats are all universal. So we've tried to make this as, uh, as easy as possible for the users, not to have a locksmith come out, completely disassemble the hardware to be able to change out the cylinder. They're all provided with a temporary construction core, so they can simply pull it out, change the core, pop it right back in. And the way the installer left it is how the hardware is gonna keep working. Okay, some of the electronic locks and accessories. Um, as I mentioned, uh, electric strikes can be used with the uh, exit devices, um, magnetic locks, shear locks, uh, keypads, um, there's lots of ways around the functionality itself, but it is highly recommended that you check with your fire code uh, before we really write them into the specs. Dependent upon the job, dependent upon the opening, all of these things can change whether or not the fire department's going to allow certain things like a magnetic lock or a shear lock. Keep in mind that a magnetic lock or a shear lock is inherently fail safe. Fail safe just meaning that when the power goes out, your lock doesn't work. Okay, when you use a, an electric strike, however, you have the option of a fail secure or fail safe. Most fire departments do not allow a fail safe. The reasoning behind that is if there is a fire in the building, the electronics shut off. And the reason being is they don't want people to wander into a fire by accident. So if that door is fail safe, that means it's unlocked from the exterior, which means any patron can open up that door and walk right in and unfortunately have a safety issue. Okay, as I mentioned, small format is our, our choice. Um, it can be used with box rail locks, uh, it comes standard with our uh, like six by 10 or four by 10 patch blocks. Um, ladder poles, I'm sorry, locking ladder poles, our ACH uh, exit devices, and a small slew of other products I can't think of at the moment. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, going into a little bit more detail, the magnetic locks, the pros, um, they're very simple. Uh, very simple to install, very simple to operate. It's really um, broken down into its simplest form. Uh, it's, a light, it's a light bulb. So your lamp is either on or it's off. That's a maglock. 
So it's very simple. They're very strong. You can get up to, um, I, I've seen up to a 6,000 pound holding force, which I find quite crazy. Um, this particular one on the screen right now, I believe it's got a 1,200 pound holding force. Uh, when you're referring to heavy glass doors, um, you're really not going to be able to put more than you know, a few hundred pounds on it before you have different issues with that maglock still holding strong. Um, they're flexible in the aspect that as long as that magnet and the armature come together, they can be pretty much mounted anywhere you want. Um, reliability, as long as you've got electricity, that maglock's working. So in that aspect, they're very, very simple to use. Um, the cons about it, as I mentioned, the local authority, you gotta make sure that they're okay with it in that particular instance. Um, they function like a deadbolt, so it's either on or off. You're either locked or unlocked. Um, you do have some residual magnetism. That's usually not too big of an issue. Um, appearance, back locks are visible. So you can see it hanging down from the header in most applications, coming off the jam, whatever the case may be. Um, existing hardware interference, uh, what I'm referring to there is like a, a full height ladder pole kind of getting in the way. Um, floor to ceiling clearance, um, code is six foot eight minimum head clearance. So if you're right at that six foot eight, now you've got a mag block hanging down three or four inches, you can end up with some issues there. Uh, as I mentioned, they're inherently fail safe. That's why you do run into some fire code issues. Okay, simple locking systems, my favorite, just a, a simple mechanical locking system for a simple, you know, uh, let's say hallway corridor, offices, things like that. Uh, taking all of the electronics out of the scenario uh, can be used with a simple uh, Adam's right latch lock is up in the left hand corner. Um, on that particular one, they've got a push bar that goes across for the push side of the door and an eight inch pull at the exterior. Um, giving a little bit of that panic type of function to it can be used with a paddle handle on the interior. Um, the large picture in the center there, it's just working with um, like an Adams Wright 4560. It's a very small lever handle. Again, I think of it more like a glorified thumb turn. Um, in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a patch with um, an Ilco Unican mechanical um, combination lock. Um, that particular one is strictly mechanical. There's no batteries, there's no wiring, there's, it's a very simple aspect to it. Um, we've got one in our offices here that we use uh, for a specific conference room. And it's really just, we want to have only specific people using that area. So it's a real simple, inexpensive way to do it. In the bottom right hand corner, um, we've got a custom, I call it the horseshoe shape patch fitting. And that one's working with the cylindrical lock set. So that's a good example of, you know, maybe having a keying system without the, throughout the building. Uh, maybe even having some wood doors or hollow metal doors that are using a specific manufacturer's cylindrical lock. Custom patches can be made to accommodate that cylindrical lock. Cylindrical locks are slightly different throughout different manufacturers, but they all function the same way. So trying to adapt that to patch fitting is, is relatively easy to do. <coughs> As I mentioned a few times here, the NGA and GANA have combined over the last couple of years, I'm sure you're aware of. Um, they put out a new uh, heavy glass door design guide that I highly recommend. Um, I'm a glass nerd, so it's not a, a boring read for me. Um, but it's a great place to look at when you're kind of designing that opening to see what are the parameters, what can I get away with, you know, what, what is it actually going to look like when I add fins or, or things to that, that respect. So uh, you can find this, I believe their website is glass.org, um, just looking for that heavy glass door design guide, and it'll, it does a great job of walking through. One of the things that it has um, is the guidelines for heavy glass doors. Now, the chart looks a little complicated. It's, it's really simple, though. You're broken down into two sections, full rails, so that P-style door, or patch fittings, so more like that A-style door. So when you're using a full top and bottom rail door, and 
you don't have the ability to use a floor closer. What's the biggest door that I can make? Well, the biggest door that I see on this chart is going to be 108 inches tall and 42 inches wide. And that's going to be using half inch glass. And I get the question quite often, how come three quarter inch glass means I have a smaller door? Well, in this application, you're looking at a much heavier door. That three quarter inch thick glass is going to get you about nine pounds a square foot. So using an overhead concealed closer is just not going to be strong enough for a door bigger than three foot wide and seven foot tall. So they've taken that into account. However, if you go to a floor closer using three quarter inch thick glass, that can take you all the way up to a 10 foot tall by four foot wide. Okay, using patch fittings in that same scenario really gets kind of tricky because you don't have as much support. You're just into a little patch fitting. So using that patch fitting with a floor closer, they're going to max that out at nine feet tall, 108 inches. So this chart can really help identify what the minimums and maximums are. So you don't run into any problems down the line as opposed to at the design stage. Okay, another nice one that's in there too. It's uh, extremely helpful. Um, knowing that standard two-sided support. So two-sided support, meaning that you've got, let's say a glazing channel at the top and a glazing channel at the bottom. There's your two points. So in doing so, this chart will help you identify exactly where your maximums are at. So if I'm using half inch glass, the maximum height of 120 inches when I'm only two-sided support. You've got nothing on the verticals tying it in. Once you do, you're into a different world where this chart's no longer valid as this is only a two-sided support. Okay. Some of the three-sided supports you start to see is when you get into support fins. So you may still not have it tied into the side, but these support fins tied into the head you see in the picture there are allowing any type of wind load to keep that glass from flexing inward and causing it to pop out. Your typical bite on glass is, is only about three eighths. So if that glass flexes too much, the bottom of that glass pops out of the support channel, you've got a problem. So these support fins are allowing that, that added wind load, if you will, to keep that glass from flexing. So it does cause another sight line, if you will, but using that same type of glass, in this case, I believe it's half inch clear tempered, um, still gives you the aesthetics of that all glass opening. Okay, a couple uh, different designs on the fins. Um, functionally speaking, doesn't matter. You're not adding any more support by using a radius versus a tapered or vice versa. Uh, biggest trick is it just it has to be anchored in at the head. That's where you're getting all that added support from. So you're really just looking at aesthetics, whether or not you want the radius corner or the tapered corner. Um, the only thing to mention is with the tapered corner, that bottom portion, as you see in the illustration in the upper right hand corner, um, the absolute minimum is six inch. So the top, your C dimension, is gonna be determined by how much wind load is needed, what the overall size is, all that fun stuff. Um, the structural engineer on the job would, would allow you to, to help get that dialed in. Okay, one of the problems we ran into, uh, just as an example, the architect had this drawn out, that the panels were eight foot wide, 11 foot, six inch tall, uh, definitely outside of the Ghana guidelines. So they came to us to uh, problem solve. Let's figure out what can we do to still allow this opening uh, we want it to be heavy glass and the sizes are dialed in. What do we need to add to make this, this happen? So this is the one you saw earlier where we were able to hit the engineering report and the wind load requirements by adding a full height fin at the interior. So that's where even the one we saw earlier that was just from the floating header up to the ceiling wasn't enough. We needed that full height to run all the way down. And that was dialed in by the structural engineer on the job. So working with those guys as well can be a huge help. Uh, the future of all glass doors. We're really starting to see people want more and more at the exterior. Those 
uh, traditional storefront aluminum doors where you've got a narrow style, medium style, or wide style. Um, narrow style is a two inch profile, doesn't give you a whole lot of meat, if you will, uh, for most hardware. Uh, medium style being three and a half inches, you're starting to get a little bit too big. Wide style, again, it's kind of big and bulky. Everybody's really looking for more glass. At the same time, we still have to meet those NFRC ratings, um, the low U factors, uh, air infiltration, all of these things can be an issue. Um, so things like this door you see here is a uh, Bloomcraft Entice door. So that's working with a one inch insulated, thermally improved top, bottom and vertical styles. Um, the vertical styles are only inch and eighth wide. Um, they are utilizing most of the time uh, a center hung pivot set. It can be done with an offset pivot, uh, but you're really not gaining anything by going offset pivot versus center hung. I can usually talk to the architect and kind of show them the difference. Center hung, we can at least keep everything concealed, um, keep it nice and tight. The, in this case, panic devices, um, at the exterior, and then we've got the dummy handles at the interior set of the vestibule, just to kind of mimic the outside, um, is actually going through the one inch insulated glass itself. Um, we patented some donuts, is what we call them, to basically allow that hole to be through the insulated glass. So that's how we're able to hit the NFRC ratings and U factors as low as a 0.43. Now that's, again, going to be dependent upon what's going on around it. Um, this particular one has fixed side lights next to the doors themselves. Those are also entice um, side lights to match the top and bottom, as well as the vertical profiles. And it also is thermally improved and using that same one inch insulated glass. And this is one we did in New York. Um, I was doing one of these webinars with uh, another group and one of the guys chimed in and said, hey, I was just there yesterday. This is a few blocks away from my house. So out of the New York area, I believe they used an offset pivot top and bottom. So you can still kind of see the knuckles a little bit there, uh, but it did allow that door to kind of swing out into the opening itself. So everything from the, um, from the end user's name across there and down is utilizing the end type system. Um, you'll see some uh, intermediate verticals that go for the uh, fixed lights next to the opening. Um, but that's how they were able to keep that, that nice clean sight line going all the way across. Um, again, the intermediate verticals are made to kind of keep that same profile. So in this particular case, depending upon what the wind load um, criteria is, that's what's going to determine the maximum heights allowed. So again, you're using a one inch glass, so you got to be really careful. Too large of a one inch insulated piece of glass can allow that exterior light to flex too much. So that's why we've really tried to dial in the, the wind load requirements to, to dictate what those are. Um, that's about all I got for you guys today. Um, if you have any questions, uh, my name and number as well as email is up on the screen. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us with any type of uh, questions or comments that you may have, and we can help, uh, help get you dialed in. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. For more continuing education opportunities, please visit the RAIC website at raic.org slash continuing education.